So, uh, you know, last time we uh, began by talking about solar uh, energy, uh, specifically so that, you know, solar uh, direct applications of solar energy in devices uh, or in certain processes uh, can be uh, uh, used. And uh, so uh, it's, it's important to uh, understand a little better, you know, although keeping it still quite quali qualitative, um, the kinds of, uh, uh, you know, properties, uh, the, the way we are set up in our earth, you know, with relationship to the sun, uh, these are uh, important to know about uh, because uh, at the end of it, you know, uh, all of that essentially uh, determines uh, how efficiently uh, we can harness the uh, solar energy. So, I mean, uh, let us try and first uh, uh, understand uh, our Earth and in relationship to the, uh, to the sun, okay? Now, uh, first, one of the very important things as all of us know uh, is that, uh, uh, you know, this is, of course, what uh, is perpendicular to the orbit uh, which the Earth takes when it, uh, revolves around the sun, you know. uh, but because the earth is tilted, okay, uh, and uh, so our celestial uh, equator is essentially this, you know, uh, so this is where our poles are, okay. and uh, so that actually makes a, a big difference, okay, and, uh, you know, this angle of the tilt, uh, is uh, we will uh, we will look at it. It's uh, uh, it, it's it's a very crucial uh, uh, angle, and that actually makes the use of uh, solar energy in uh, many cases more complicated, and also it leads to variations from location uh, to location. You know. So we need to understand that now. This particular tilt. Uh, is uh, 23.44 degree, uh, which is at present. Apparently, there was a uh, time, you know, uh, many million uh, years ago, uh, when the tilt was actually a bit uh, uh, different. It was not exactly the same value. So the value has changed uh, to uh, some extent. Okay, and so you can see it's tilted about 23 and a half degrees with respect to the plane of the orbit. So this is the plane of the orbit. Okay? Uh, so th this is very important. Make a, a note of it. Okay? And you can also ask me questions. Okay? Now, let us, of course, I think all of us uh, know it, uh, but still, uh, let, let us try and uh, uh, understand a bit more about the relationship of uh, uh, each of our uh, locations. Uh, with respect to the uh, Earth as a whole, okay, and uh, we know that uh, effectively uh, you can uh, determine any location on Earth uh, based on the uh, longitude and the latitude, okay. So uh, the longitude are basically these lines, you know, which are going from the uh, North Pole to the South Pole, you can think of, you know. And so these are longitudinal uh, lines, okay? And uh, so, uh, you know, if you are on this same line, it doesn't matter where in the uh, world you are, uh, you will actually feel a, a similar sense of uh, time, for example, okay? And uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's important that we understand longitude, okay? Now, as far as latitude is concerned, uh, if you look at the center of the Earth, okay, and uh, you know, you look at the equator, uh, let's say passing through uh, the center of the Earth, okay, and as you're going up or down, okay, uh, you know, uh, as far away from the equator you are, uh, I can draw uh, uh, an angle, all right, and uh, that particular angle uh, is, is really the latitude, okay? And all points uh, on the same latitude, 
uh, have similar uh, properties, you know, behavior in in some way. Okay, so uh, so this is the uh, uh, longitude, and and this, for example, is one uh, latitude. You know, you can see a circle, right? Uh, and remove from the the plane of the equator, you know, this one. Uh, so and as you go more and more, the latitude will become that angle will become higher and higher. You know, uh, so so that's effectively what you uh, have. All right. Now you can also break up the uh, uh, Earth into uh, like uh, four quadrants. Okay, and uh, so if you are on the north, you know, and the east, okay, if you are on that kind of a, a quadrant, uh, you know, all your angles are positive. Okay, uh, all the points are uh, positive. Okay, uh, if you are on the uh, bottom side, uh, then of course we uh, would define. You can either define latitude uh, saying so and so degree south, or you can uh, define it with a negative uh, number. Okay. Uh, similarly, uh, for the uh, for the longitude, uh, as you go east, you know this part. Uh, is uh, positive, okay. Uh, on the top means positive latitude angle, and you are towards the east. Uh, then this particular quadrant uh, is the positive quadrant, okay. Uh, over here you are positive in uh, uh, longitude but negative in latitude. Uh, over here uh, you are uh, 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 positive in uh, uh, latitude and negative in longitude. And in the bottom one, you are negative in latitude and negative in uh, longitude. You know, so and and these are arbitrary lines. Like we we've, we've got one is the equator. Okay, I mean we know the equator is one uh, line. Similarly, uh, what we consider to be like the uh, uh, you know with with reference to which uh, we talk about east and uh, uh, west, uh, that uh, is the basically the Greenwich. Uh, prime meridian, and uh, you know that intersects the equator. Okay, and that's how the uh, globe gets divided into four uh, quadrants. Okay, so you can see northwest, northeast, southwest, and southeast are the four. All points are positive north of the equator and east of the prime meridian, and negative south of the equator and west of the prime meridian. Okay. So, so this is all positive, this quadrant, and this is all uh, negative. Okay? Now, <clears throat> uh, uh, now this is what makes it so interesting uh, when uh, when one looks at the uh, way the Earth is orbiting around the uh, the Sun, uh, because as we said, the celestial plane uh, is at an angle with respect. Uh, to the uh, orbital plane, you know. So this is the orbital plane where you can think of the sun being in the middle, okay. And this is the plane cutting across, okay. But because of the way the Earth is, you know, it's tilted, okay. So effectively, what happens is that as it is moving, you know, uh, there are two situations, you know, where the uh, uh, this plane you know, uh, is uh, intersecting with this plane, okay, the plane of the sun, okay, the plane of the sun and the plane of the earth, you know, are interacting, intersecting at two points, okay, and these are what we refer to as the equinox, okay, one is the vernal equinox, which is March 21st, okay, and another is the autumnal equinox, uh, which is September 23rd, you know, now, what happens at the equinox? Now, this is very interesting. You see, in fact, let's go through a few uh, more things because the Earth is tilted at an angle of 23.5 degree, as you uh, saw. You know, so what happens is that uh, uh, you know uh, uh, it is only when uh, this plane, okay, uh, this is intersecting with our plane of the sun that over here uh, what you end up doing is that 
having uh, uh, a situation uh, where effectively we have equal day and equal sun uh, during the two equinoxes. Now, when you and and the Earth is traveling in this direction, like anticlockwise, okay, and when you come to what is known as the winter solstice, all right, which is December twenty first. Now, what happens is that because the Earth is tilted, okay, uh, now this is the position, you know, where effectively what happens is that the tilt is such and the rays of the sun are going this way now there are four different uh, latitudes uh, which you need to keep in mind okay uh, one is uh, the tropic of cancer uh, which is towards the north of the earth okay then you have at the bottom uh, the tropic of capricorn okay and above that you have your uh, arctic circle uh, and your antarctic circle okay so arctic circle is here and antarctic circle is here on the south side okay uh, the antarctic circle okay now uh, if you see uh, these angles you know uh, that the angle uh, uh, is such you know uh, that the capricorn the tropic of capricorn which is to the south of the equator is at an angle of 23.5 degree south which is equivalent to the tilt angle you know how much the earth is tilted and similarly the tropic of cancer is 23.5 degree north of the equator okay and so the angle that it is making you know uh, with respect to the uh, equator you know is 23.5 degree and in the other case it is minus 23.5 uh, so, so that's what uh, happens now because of this. What happens is that when it reaches this particular point, you know, this point is such, and we will show you uh, what these two points are: the summer uh, solstice and the winter uh, solstice. You know, uh, there is a very crucial angle, uh, which is known as the declination angle. Okay. And in a way, the declination angle is linked to the fact, you know, it's related to the tilt. Okay. So what happens is that over here, the, the light that is traveling, going towards the earth, you know, it, the, this angle, 23.5 degree and the declination angle, which I'll explain now, okay, are such that effectively you have a situation where the radiation which is reaching the tropic of capricorn is absolutely direct okay it is perpendicular to the uh, tangent over there okay so it's a direct uh, 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 radiation and so maximum solar radiation is falling over there exactly the opposite is the situation on the north in the north uh, what you'll have is that there will be only a part of the north where the light will reach you know and uh, uh, the rest of it uh, will basically be under darkness now when it is at this position and you are at the arctic circle you are basically the light will only reach up to the arctic circle you know? any point above that arctic circle will be constantly under darkness under those conditions okay and in this particular case uh, when it comes to what is known as the summer solstice okay, the maximum radiation is falling on the tropic of cancer which is on the northern hemisphere okay and uh, so over here that's why you know most of our activities everything is in the northern hemisphere you know and that's why it's called summer solstice because that's when we feel our summer you know june 21st okay so over here what you can see is that when the situation is like this the maximum amount of uh, uh, light you know is falling on the northern hemisphere you know and the southern hemisphere and especially 
the points below the uh, antarctic circle will always be in darkness okay when we are at the summer solstice all right in these two cases you will have equal time of uh, light and darkness whereas here uh, uh, you will have a situation where in the northern hemisphere uh, there will be relatively more darkness and relatively less light and during the summer solstice you'll have relatively more light and relatively less darkness in the northern hemisphere okay so if you were to look at now this rotation okay uh, what you can see okay is this point this is what is the arctic circle okay above that you, know, you the sun will never set okay when you are over here you know so consider this particular case that you are at the summer solstice the sun will never set here okay? similarly over here you know the sun will never rise if you are uh, uh, you know at a latitude more negative than the antarctic circle okay? now in these particular cases as you can see okay, in in this particular case this situation you have equal day and equal night those are related to the vernal equinoxes you know? these are the situations when you will have equal day and equal night okay and uh, you know and uh, as i said uh, when you are at uh, these kinds of situations you will have a longer day and uh, shorter night and over here you will have a uh, basically a, a longer night and a shorter day okay? in the northern hemisphere and exactly the opposite will be the situation uh, in the uh, southern hemisphere so let us uh, just read uh, so that you understand uh, vernal equinox and autumnal equinox the declination angle now i have not explained the declination angle which i should have okay um, i should have started with that first but never mind i'll go to that now okay uh, and hence equal day and night in most portions okay now let us try and explain what is the declination angle declination angle is you, you have seen that depending on where you are you know uh, there is a constant change uh, that is taking place okay now declination angle is with respect to the sun the position where you are you know the if you look at the equator you know like this is the equatorial plane and this is the origin the center of the earth you know now if you draw a, an angle from the equatorial plane to the the direction in which the sun's rays are falling remember the sun's rays are traveling in a straight line okay this angle right is known as the declination angle okay this one all right now this angle the declination angle is 23.5 degree at this point when you are at this point this angle of the sun's rays with the plane of the equator you know from the origin uh, it is 23.5 degree okay. and when you are at the winter solstice you know, okay where in fact you know what we saw is you you can see also what is happening that the radiation you know the point at which it is absolutely perpendicular to the earth is at the tropic of capricorn have you seen at this point if i draw a tangent to the earth okay this is 90 degree okay so it is direct it's perpendicular this is the point that is receiving you know the most direct radiation from the sun here okay this is the tropic of cancer you know and so if i draw the tangent okay, you can see that at the summer solstice it is at the tropic of cancer in the northern hemisphere that you the sun's radiation is coming perpendicular to the tropic of cancer okay remember that so that is the reason why these latitudes have been fixed it has been fixed keeping in mind 
the four different positions of the sun of the earth with respect to the sun which is the two equinoxes okay and the summer solstice and the winter solstice okay uh, now what you must also remember is that this is the extreme position you know this is the position that i talked about you know so where you can see that the sun rays okay are now if you look at the equator okay and the center of the earth over here you know, this plane okay now you can see this angle that it makes with respect to this plane okay is minus 23.5 degree okay that means if this is the yeah if i if i show this as my uh, line along the plane you know this angle is minus 23.5 degree why minus because it is below the uh, uh, equator okay so when i go this way i am basically going from 0 degree upwards okay and here i am going from 0 degree downwards right so uh, that that's how my uh, convention is okay so this is why this angle you know now is minus 23.5 degree with respect to this line and over here with respect to the same line it is 23.5 degree plus 23.5 degree because the sun uh, is really falling on the northern hemisphere the tropic of cancer okay is that clear to everyone has everyone understood this the declination angle yes sir all clear okay okay now so now what you can see is that these positions these two positions are the ones where the declination angle is zero okay in other words the light is falling directly it's as if you know the the earth is no longer tilted you know and the light is falling directly uh, on you can say the main equatorial uh, uh, plane you know that's where it is falling it's over there okay and in other places as i said it will fall on the extremities of the tropic of cancer and the tropic of capricorn okay so what you therefore have is a situation where the declination angle can change from a maximum value of plus 23.5 degree to a minimum value of minus 23.5 degree so here it is plus 23.5 and here it is minus 23.5 okay and over here the declination angle is zero in both these cases okay so you can see now this is therefore the variation of the declination angle as a function of the time of the day of the year so if you start with january 1st and you start your numbering from that day you know january 1st means n is equal to 1 right and this is that n all right so what you have is now you have two situations you can see and this is your declination angle okay over here the declination angle is zero over here also the declination angle is zero okay here the declination angle the summer solstice is 23.5 degree and here it is minus 23.5 degree okay so these are the extremities of uh, of the de declination angle now i might ask you simple questions like uh, uh, you know you calculate uh, uh, the declination angle uh, for uh, for a particular uh, day of the year you know now it is given by this particular equation okay the declination angle is represented by delta okay so sin delta is equal to 0.39 795 times the cosine of 0.98563 times n minus 1173 where n basically is a number starting from january 1 equal to 1 okay is that clear this equation 
Yes, sir. All clear? Huh? Uh, under which condition would uh, this cosine uh, value be equal to uh, uh, one? Huh? Whether it can be zero? Yeah. No, no. So, what is cos zero? One. One. The so cos zero will be one. Right. Okay. Uh, so what happens is that when cos zero is equal to one, okay, okay, and uh, so you 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 you've got this, all right. Uh, now, uh, so you you can work out. Now you take the, the so the, this will become one. So this will become zero point three nine seven nine five, okay, and uh, the, which is the value of the sine delta. So if sine delta is 0 0.39795, uh, just see what is delta, the sine inverse? 23.45. Right, 23.45. Yeah. So you can see that basically uh, n equal to 173, okay? All right, is effectively uh, your uh, uh, summer solstice you know, like for example, uh, uh, you take till uh, uh, let's say till June. If I roughly take uh, 180 days, okay, and out of that I uh, uh, subtract uh, a few days, okay, um, say uh, uh, seven days, okay, uh, I'm closer to June 21st, right? Okay, and so you can see that so yeah, n will be equal actually to 173. Uh, on June 21st, okay, which is uh, uh, which is your uh, summer solstice, and so this number uh, will become this will become zero, and therefore this will become one, and therefore my uh, sine inverse uh, of that, uh, which is the angle, uh, will be 23.5 degree. Okay, huh. you understood, no? Is that clear to everyone? Yes, sir. All clear? Yes, sir. Yeah. So I want yes, to understand. All right. So whenever you know you see something and obviously someone has worked out this equation, you know, just try to verify it. Okay. Try to verify. Huh? And likewise, you know, you may uh, also want to verify uh, under uh, which conditions uh, you can see the time of uh, or the day uh, when you have the autumnal and Vernal equinox, you know, and uh, try to work out what is the values of n, and then you put this in, and they just see what is the value of the uh, cosine that you get, okay, and whether from that uh, you are able to get a declination angle uh, which is equal to uh, 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 this, okay, all right. Uh, so just uh, uh, try and work those things out. Uh, have all of you seen that? Uh, um, uh, or when you have these uh, uh, photovoltaic panels and all, uh, which are put, that they are put at a slight angle. Have you ever noticed it, or have you ever seen a photovoltaic panel? Yes, sir. And have you seen that many times? You know, they are put at a slant, at an angle. Yes, yes sir. sir. You have seen. Hmm? Okay. So you know, so that that's if you don't know all this, then you wouldn't know how to get the maximum uh, current out of your PV panel. Yeah. That's why you need to know all this stuff. All right. Huh? So uh, let us try now and uh, uh, understand uh, uh, a few uh, basic things, uh, especially of uh, remember. Uh, whenever the sun is falling okay, on a device, you want to make sure that the sun's rays are falling as perpendicularly and as directly as possible on your device so that you are harnessing the maximum amount of energy. Okay? Whereas, if it is falling at a very oblique angle, you know, then it's not going to be so useful. Right? Uh, so that is what you need to uh, uh, understand, right? So uh, 
let us now try and uh, see this okay for a situation where uh, we are talking about uh, a situation where uh, uh, we are talking about a place okay uh, yeah this is chicago okay in the united states okay and uh, the latitude of chicago is 41.8 degree in other words you know what is 41.8 so if chicago is it a point okay now this is your uh, uh, horizontal line going to the equator and from here when you are going you know uh, uh, over here to chicago this particular angle is 41.8 degree okay so that is your latitude Forty-one point eight. Okay, now that's okay. I mean, you can uh, take this. Hmm? All right. Now, uh, uh, if you uh, uh, were to, uh, there are two uh, important angles that you uh, must uh, know. Okay. Now, in this particular case, this is a situation where the declination angle is zero degree. In other words, you can see the sun's radiations are coming absolutely parallel to this uh, equator. Okay, that's where it is. So there is no angle. Whereas here, you had an angle. Okay, so this was an angle of 23.5. Whereas if you are at the equinox, the declination angle is zero degree. Okay, so effectively, what you have now. Is and you have a latitude of forty-one point eight degree. Okay, so there are two important angles which you uh, must try and remember. And you would have heard all these terms, uh, but just so that you are uh, familiar. Okay, one is what is known as the solar elevation angle. Okay, the elevation angle, and the other is known as the zenith angle. Okay. so let us try and understand what are these two angles okay. now any point on earth wherever you are because it's a sphere i can draw a tangent to that sphere correct everybody agrees i can draw a tangent yes sir okay right so that's what i'm doing i'm taking this point chicago you know at 41.8 degree latitude and i'm drawing a tangent now this line is obviously perpendicular to this tangent all right this particular line 90 degrees okay now what you have is that if i now look at chicago 41.8 degree what is that 41.8 degree it is 41.8 degree with respect to this angle all right so this is also known as the zenith angle okay now if i were to take the other part so this whole thing is 90 degree because this is perpendicular okay this angle over here is known as the elevation angle all right okay so this is the elevation angle the angle which the sun's rays make with respect to the horizontal okay the tangent which i am drawing on that particular point so this is my tangent the angle that it is making with this tangent okay with respect to the horizontal so this is the horizontal and this is the vertical okay this is known as my angle of elevation now you can see the same angle here this is that horizontal i am this is my earth i am standing here okay this is my ground so i'll draw a tangent this is the tangent okay and this is how my radiation is falling with respect to this ground this tangent exactly the same situation here okay this is my ground it's like this horizontal line okay and this is my radiation coming and this angle is 48.2 degree why is it 48.2 because this angle is 41.8 and 90 minus 41.8 is equal to 48.2 degree okay 
so this is my angle of elevation okay and this angle is known as my zenith angle okay all right and the two together will add up to 90 degree is that clear yes sir yes sir absolutely clear yes sir okay. now have you understood this yes yes sir yes okay. now let us take a case right now here where we are talking about the summer solstice right okay yeah. now in the summer solstice uh, what did we say that the declination angle is 23.5 degree okay so this angle is 20.5 degree the angle that the sun rays are making with respect to the this horizontal angle uh, on which the equator is located okay now if i were to now again you know uh, take the, the sun is not just only shining over here the sh sun is shining everywhere okay now the sun let's say is also falling on chicago okay which was at a latitude of 41.8 degree okay now what you can see is that you know this angle is that latitude of 41.8 degree and the angle which which the sun made at chicago over here you know this angle is 23.41.8 degree minus 23.5 degree okay and uh, so you know now i know okay that my angle of elevation is effectively what which angle it is this angle this angle with the horizontal okay and this is the angle right of my zenith angle this is my 41.8 degree okay and my declination angle is 23.5 degree this angle so effectively this angle is equal to now what this angle okay will be equal to 41.8 degree minus 23.5 degree that is this angle the zenith angle and this angle therefore will be equal to 90 degree minus in bracket i put 41.8 degree minus 23.5 degree and so alpha which is my elevation angle is equal to 71.7 degree <coughs> okay so what does that mean now it means that the sun's rays are falling more perpendicular to the ground okay? so this angle now is 71.7 degree and that's the reason why during the uh, summer times you know uh, you obviously get maximum solar insulation you know and how it is uh, effectively uh, uh, you know it's so perpendicular okay and uh, so you can see the extremities okay now look at the situation when you are uh, in in the winter solstice and in all these cases i'm still looking at chicago still looking at the same place okay now what is the declination angle now this is my declination angle this is the sun rays this is the uh, line you know along the equator okay and so this angle now is minus 23.5 degree why because i'm going from zero origin i'm going to the south Minus twenty three point five degree. Okay. At this point, mind you, you can see. Look at the interesting thing. If I draw a tangent here on the Tropic of Capricorn, this sun's radiation is falling absolutely perpendicular to it. Over here, right? Here, you know, 
the angle is highly slanted with respect to the tangent over here the tangent keeps changing so here the tangent this is my tangent at this point this is my tangent at chicago okay so you can see that the angle of elevation with respect to the ground which is this horizontal part the tangent ground means tangent okay so you can see this is the angle it is highly skewed you know highly uh, you know uh, uh, very very slanted uh, uh, falling of the sun's radiation in chicago uh, during the winter solstice when the declination angle is minus 23.5 degree okay yeah. now what is this angle okay yeah. this angle now right is effectively what so i have got i can i can actually i can just like i have a horizontal line here you know i could have made a horizontal line here okay i could have made a horizontal line here okay and this angle with respect to that horizontal line which is parallel to this line would have been 41.8 degree and this other angle over here would have been equal to 23.5 degree the same angle okay so this total angle now is equal to 41.8 degree minus minus 23.5 degree because this is minus that basically becomes equal to how much is it 60 uh, uh, 65.3 degree okay that is this angle and this angle over here is now 90 degree minus 65.3 degree which is equal to 24.7 degree and the two together is equal to 90 degree all right and so you can see in chicago you know during the winter solstice that the angle the rays are falling very very slanted this is that 24.7 degree okay this same 24.7 degree this angle with respect to the tangent or the ground so so this is extremely important uh for you to uh, uh know okay uh, because what you have to do is suppose you say that i want to set up some solar panels in my house you know so i must know firstly where am i located on earth what is my latitude okay. once i know my latitude and i also know that the declination angle etc uh, will keep changing how will i most optimally place my solar panel so that if i take over the year i get maximum insulation okay that is what i have to do right so now like look at uh, this for example there are two equations for the angle of elevation which is alpha alpha is equal to 90 degree minus and then pi my latitude minus right delta which is basically my declination angle okay and so whatever day of the year you are i know what is the declination angle of that from this particular plot i can figure out from here okay so from there you know i'll be able to get my delta I, latitude is fixed latitude doesn't change for a place so i know that value all right and i just take this and i'll be able to calculate by alpha all clear yes sir yes sir okay all right now there is one more thing uh, that we need to understand uh, which is what is known as solar noon okay now noon is that we know that uh, typically at 12 o'clock in the afternoon okay uh, you you get the most direct sun right okay and uh, what happening is that when you see because my earth is rotating right at one point my sun is coming and falling directly 
you know, in the most direct way on that particular place. As my earth is rotating, right, and it is moving away, it is shifting away from the sun, right. So effectively, what will happen, you know, is that I will start I, I, in the extreme. Uh, I will again enter into darkness, right? Uh, so we have a portion of the day uh, when it is lighted and portion of the day when it is dark. Uh, when is it lighted and most lighted? When I have got what is known as the solar noon with the sun falling directly on that place. And as my earth is rotating and it's going away, you know, I'm going away from the sun. Okay. So effectively, that is what we mean by time of day. That is what time of day is. Right? Now, what we define is what is known as a local noon. By the way, this is all local at one particular place. You know, at any particular place at 12 o'clock, we say that you have local noon. That is the time when uh, uh, maximum sunshine is falling. Okay. Now, what's happening is because the earth is rotating and in 24 hours, it is covering 360 degree rotation, right? Okay. Uh, to come from one place back to that same place, I've got 360 degrees, which is being covered. Okay. And because we have broken it up into 24 hours, you know, so per hour, I can say that there is a shift of 15 degrees okay 360 divided by 24 is equal to 15 all right so what we do is that we fix the convention such that at local noon you know we say that the angle omega you know that is the what we call as the hour angle okay that angle by convention is taken as zero degree okay and now, if I want to figure out the angle, the hour angle at any other time, okay, so what I'll do is I'll fix up the time. Say, for example, over here it says that using a 24 hour time scale for the day, right, uh, uh, T is equal to 12 at local noon. We know it's 12 o'clock. Okay, so that is the 12. All right. And at t is equal to 6.5 degree uh, 6.5 at five and a half hours before local noon that means i am going to reach local noon only after six and a half hours you know? so if i'm at for example england okay and we have got a, a time difference of six and a half or five hours five and a half or whatever you know so they will reach their local noon about five hours after we do Okay, so that's what it is. And if I'm at say T is equal to 18.25, okay, which is six and one quarter hours after local noon, so my T is equal to 18.25. Okay, so I say uh, uh, quarter past six, you know, in the evening, that is T is equal to 18.25. So I'll put, you know, that whatever is that T uh, value over here, you know. So from that, I can work out the hour angle. Okay, so imagine when I am at t is equal to 12, what will happen? 12 minus 12 is equal to 0. My omega is equal to 0. 15 times 0 is 0. Okay, so at 12 noon, my hour angle is equal to 0. Okay? If I am at past, if t is greater than 12, then I'll work out my hour angle will be uh, uh, effectively uh, 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 positive. And if T is less than 12, my hour angle will be negative, omega will be negative. Okay? That's all it is. Is it clear to everyone? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So now when I know all of this, you know, I can actually finally calculate the solar elevation, okay, that angle of solar elevation, alpha, at any time of day, okay, and uh, uh, you know, and not only that, 
now i have got a situation where i have been able to what i have got my uh, time of day which is fixed i know the latitude you know uh, of and i know the declination angle from the day right so which day of the year will tell me what is my declination angle all right where i am with respect to the equator will tell me what is my latitude which is equal to my pi okay? and delta is my declination angle and which time of the day i am in okay will tell me what is my hour angle which is equal to omega so that means time of day can be expressed either in terms of an angle or in terms of hour and minutes as we do you know but because we are dealing with a trigonometry over here you know so uh, you know so what what will be important is to effectively convert the time of day into an angle right which is what this equation does you know? it converts it into an angle so now i can write the solar elevation angle is equal to the sine inverse of this figure sine delta sine latitude sine pi sine declination sine pi plus cos declination cos hour angle cos latitude okay so i can actually and why is it so important because this is precisely what i want to know at any given time of the day you know what is the angle that the sun's rays are making with respect to the ground which is my tangent okay that's what i need to know and that's how i'll optimize any device so if i am for example if i want to keep tracking the sun you know as many different uh, gadgets do you know there are gadgets which will uh, constantly move in a way that you are keeping on tracking the sun so that you are at all times trying to be as direct you know with respect to the sun you know so i'll tilt my Uh, device, you know, in a way that I am perpendicular to. This. That's what I try to do. And why do I want to do that? Because I want to maximize the amount of insulation falling on the device so that I get the maximum effect. So you can, for example, find out in Mumbai, you know, uh, where uh, uh, what your angle of elevation is. You know, there is a uh, there is a software. Uh, maybe you can. Uh, i don't know it still work it, it is a uh, it's a calculator okay so you just have to put in all these values you know of your omega uh, alpha etc and it will basically be able to you know uh, tell you you know uh, uh, what is the angle of elevation okay in your case okay so that's what it will do it is basically telling you the solar elevation okay with respect to time as i told you 360 degree represents 24 hours this is, these plots are made at different months okay so this is uh, december january february march april may uh, etc you know so that's how effectively these plots are made you know uh, uh, in a say uh, uh, what is what it is in on november uh, uh, 12 uh, or 11 uh, today I, i can figure it out i know the latitude i know the time of the year and i know the time of day when i want to measure it okay. all right so this is basically the fundamentals of the uh, how solar insulation uh, actually uh, uh, falls so now that we have uh, uh, you know discussed this uh, we will we will start talking about various ways uh, of harnessing uh, solar energy now remember that the optimum insulation which will fall on any particular device is going to be dictated by what i just told you okay but many times in reality you may not be able to do it but it is important for you to know okay now let us look at you know some of the uh, applications you know of uh, uh, of solar energy okay uh and uh, i think uh, uh, 
uh, what you need to understand is that solar when we say solar energy uh, we really are talking about two different components okay we are talking about the thermal energy in solar energy no? and when we say thermal energy we are really it's still the electromagnetic spectrum but we are talking about longer wavelengths you know things like infrared radiation and longer wavelengths okay when you are talking about uh, light energy okay uh, you are really talking about uh, either the visible spectrum or you are talking about the ultraviolet spectrum and that's where we talk about uh, light you know and so if you have got photosynthesis you know from plants that photosynthesis is occurring uh, because of the effect of light which is falling on the on the leaves is not because of the thermal energy which is falling on the leaves okay uh, so there are two distinct applications of solar energy one which exploits the photons in solar energy typically in the visible and ultraviolet uh, spectrum okay. the second is what we call the thermal energy which really exploits the longer wavelength radiation in solar energy uh, which is uh, you know all things uh, uh, related to uh, infrared and beyond okay so now the most fundamental for us for example you know just imagine the sensation of sight that we can see and 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 that's all because of uh, solar energy falling on our eye but which solar energy the visible spectrum and that is what leads to this chemical change which is uh, cis retinal going to uh, trans retinal you know and that is what then creates uh, electrical signals which we uh, perceive and see you know and uh, so there is nothing more fundamental than being able to see and uh, it is all dictated by photons so you can see both photosynthesis and the sensation of sight you know uh, are bo both related to photons these are all related to photons okay. water cycle water cycle is related to what which type of energy thermal thermal energy. thermal energy okay so water cycle is related to thermal energy right and uh, very distinct from uh, from these okay although they are only different parts of the solar spectrum okay. electrical power photovoltaic panel is related to which part the photons or the thermal photons or photons 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 right okay so here we are talking about again you know uh, these all these pv panels etc we are really talking about photon energy okay the light part now you can for example uh, have potential energy uh, from uh, uh, from solar energy okay like for example potential energy is our rain clouds okay? uh, or when they falls on the mountains that's all potential energy you know that water can fall okay or i can tell you for example uh in uh, uh in uh, uh during the rio olympics you know uh in rio de janeiro there is one particular place you know where there is a creek okay lots of water and right above that uh, is a hill top a mountain you know and these people actually were during the day time you know they were continuously pumping water from the creek to the mountain they created huge reservoirs in the mountain okay and during the night time you know that water was falling like a waterfall and generating power you know and so you know they actually had this uh, uh, philosophy of uh, uh, doing the entire uh, olympics you know uh, running on solar power so uh, that potential energy okay uh, now Uh, we always associate solar energy uh, with uh, heat you know 
and it is the antithesis of cold okay? solar energy means we immediately say oh hot but solar energy is very crucial you know you can actually have refrigeration cycles which are running on solar energy okay and i will discuss one of those in fact one of our professors dr bhagwat has done a lot of work on uh, solar refrigeration okay now then you have for example uh, what is a uh, is i will say more like a holy grail you know which people are uh, always hoping for which is that whether i can use sunlight solar energy uh, to split water into hydrogen and oxygen in principle there is enough energy available in the photons to do that okay but it is otherwise very difficult to do we know one way of doing it <clears throat> like for example if i if i have photovoltaic power you know i generate power and with power i do electrolysis right i can convert uh, water into hydrogen and oxygen we have learned it in school okay but there are also technologies being developed which directly try to convert the water into hydrogen and oxygen without electrolysis okay and and that is a if somebody succeeds you know in being able to do that uh, properly uh, and with efficiently high efficiency then you know that could be a real winner okay if one can do it now you as students of ict students of chemical technology i mean it could be uh, even i am taking pharma uh, as a, a, a subset of chemical technology because uh, there are so many chemical uh, compounds uh, that are also involved in uh, many of your work but for you all uh, one of the things which would be of great interest would be whether you can synthesize the all the types of molecules etc you know where normally you would use uh, fossil fuels you know uh, energy from uh, uh, fossil fuel or from electricity derived from the fossil fuels you know and if you say can i do some of those synthesis uh, with solar energy that would be a great way to use solar energy in your specific areas of interest you know and then you also have <clears throat> traditional applications of solar energy okay <clears throat> we have, we have talked about those like for example uh, uh, drying grains or uh, drying uh, uh, clothes but those are not the only ones you know solar energy is used extensively right in certain uh, uh, production of uh, very high volume chemicals okay and so we will uh, we will talk about Uh, some of those very traditional uh, applications for your interest also that the water cycle uh roughly about 40 to 50% of the solar energy that falls on earth is actually going in continuously to evaporate water okay uh, and uh, you know that is the biggest application of solar energy on earth that it it evaporate water creates clouds and then clouds will get seeded and it will rain and snow and without that there would be no life on earth you know so this is by far the biggest okay followed by this photosynthesis one taking advantage of the thermal energy in solar energy one taking advantage of the photons in solar energy the visible photons okay and the sensation of light okay so important because all the billions of people in our uh, earth and all the animals you know, everybody sees or most see you know, and uh, and all of these are typically these are all anthropogenic activities you know this is you have to make them happen okay whereas traditional is kind of half way between okay Uh, an anthropogenic activity and uh, and the natural water cycle okay and these are all uh, human made activities 
Okay. So now uh, let us uh, look at uh, well-established applications of solar energy. Okay. Now you remember we had talked about this uh, before, uh, and I would like to stress it. All that I showed you right now, you know, with the sun's rays and all, what we are talking about is basically direct radiation. You know, okay, uh, falling, you know, like a beam of light from the sun. The but on Earth, as we know, the light also partly tends to scatter. Okay, and so you have direct radiation from the sun. You also have diffuse radiation from the sun you know, which is scattered because of the earth's atmosphere now you can also like people you know starting from archimedes uh, had done that you and you have seen you can take a convex lens okay and you just put it near the uh, uh, i mean where the sun is falling okay and you keep it like that and you can burn paper okay what are you doing? You are basically concentrating the sun's radiation. Okay. And so there is also concentrated radiation, which you can get. Right. And extremely important. And many of the important applications, you know, which are being developed are based on such concentrated radiations. And I'll show you how to actually concentrate solar energy in a practical way. Okay, all clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Now you, you look at uh, agriculture. We know, of course, about photosynthesis, but you know, you there are so many places where you have greenhouses, okay, and all those greenhouses are operating on solar energy, or you go to agricultural fields, you know, and you see the guys pumping. Uh, water from the ground, groundwater, and they use these solar power pumps. You know? So there is a profound effect of uh, application of uh, solar energy, of course, in agriculture. You know? Lighting. Now, nowadays, in fact, in many places, you'll find uh, street lighting, which is uh, uh, basically solar uh, uh, driven. You know? They're all solar lanterns. In, in in remote places, villages, etc., uh, where you uh, where you electricity may not be available, you know there are lanterns which are available. Okay, you you and and they will give you nice light, solar lanterns. Okay, then solar energy to get process heat for many applications, and I'll talk about some of those. Okay? There are people you you can go and buy you can buy solar cookers. Okay. And uh, you know, this solar cookers, you can actually literally put your uh, uh, button of uh, rice and dal and uh, things like that and, and let it cook. You don't need uh, gas and things like that. Okay? So you, you can cook. As I told you, you can do chilling. You can have solar refrigeration. Okay? You can, in fact, this is one of the uh, technologies which has been much talked about. Uh, which is called SODES, you know, which is solar disinfection. You can actually just leave bottles of water out in the sun, and the UV radiation uh, from the uh, from the sun actually kills all the germs. So you just have to leave your water outside. If there's nothing else wrong with the water, only your uh, uh, bacteria, microorganisms, you know, you can kill those. You can do also desalination with solar energy not just with uh, electricity okay, or coal i can actually use solar uh, energy to even carry out desalination and i'll show you some of the applications people have integrated now buildings uh, with solar design you know? uh, it, it's you can do many things like you can cut off the heat and just allow the light to pass through you know, there are buildings which have been integrated with photovoltaic. Okay, you can do air conditioning by solar energy. You know, in buildings, okay? and so uh, you know the area of civil engineering and being a, because 
there are so many buildings na so many houses i, I mean and and we are not exploiting solar energy at all so uh, there is a wonderful opportunity uh, you know to uh, to look at it so all of you who are civil engineers uh, look at this aspect and uh, maybe you will find plenty of opportunity in fact let me tell you that india was uh, uh, one of the best known you know for its work on solar energy i am not talking about today i am talking about 60s 50s okay 1960s when uh, uh, and uh, why because india of course you know because uh, we are blessed with a lot of sunshine so it makes sense for us to uh, to look for solar energy application you know? and in fact some of the most outstanding people uh, used to work in this uh, uh, area there was a, a former director of iit uh, bombay dr sukhatme you know who was very well known in the area of solar energy you see this person dr arun datta was the president of the international solar energy society from 77 to 79 you know i mean you know that's how well uh, our work used to be recognized okay and uh, you know he had uh, made very pioneering applications i'll talk about uh, a few of these applications you know where he was recognized as a pioneer okay and uh, he he actually was earlier in the indian institute of science in bangalore you know and then later on shifted uh, to another place and uh, very well known man okay? now what happened is that actually you know today if you see all the people who are real pioneers you know who were deeply interested in solar energy you will find that they are all 80 years old 85 years old or they are no more like this man he is no more okay and uh, uh, so what happened was uh, we 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 were very good in these areas but somewhere down the line you know we never really kept up the in enthusiasm and the interest and we just let it all die maybe because oil and gas and all became uh, cheaply available and everybody started talking about you know these things as if they will last forever you know and so you know uh, uh, any time you went to talk about solar energy you know people would say oh don't tell me about solar energy it cannot compete with uh, fossil fuel you know? so they would put you down and that's how you know from the 80s there was a steady decline all right in our uh, uh, accomplishments in the area of solar energy not only did we not do any new thing the little that we knew how to do even we forgot how to do because all these people uh, retired or uh, uh, passed away you know? so uh, you know so remember when you are talking about renewable energy solar energy uh, you know you must have a long term perspective you know this is not about chasing fashion so and another as i told you and i told you this in the initially and i am telling you uh, uh, again you know uh, look uh, i think in this course you need to take a much broader understanding of uh, solar energy if you listen to all the uh, all the people that i listen to you know i mean coming on television etc and when they talk you know for them solar energy is all about electricity power grid power you know we'll generate so many gigawatts so many this that you know as if there is no other use of solar energy uh, which is happening in the world it shows very poor understanding okay and what you must do is that you must have uh, and when you are talking to people you should say hey who told you we do so many things with solar energy and uh, so uh, and you can see uh, this man okay you don't see anything about solar photovoltaics being talked about in his contribution what did he talk about considered a pioneer 
his major contributions were in salt production to solar evaporation solar distillation solar pond space cooling is not talking about uh, generating uh, grid power and this power and that all the discussions today have got hijacked in that direction yes i am not saying there's anything wrong with it but there are thousands of other things with solar energy that can be done uh, which you must see as what i will call as low hanging fruits you know you first try to uh, basically pick those low hanging fruits you know try to make use of those which are cost effective practical and then you go on to things which are uh, you know uh, maybe of a higher uh, higher uh, uh, grade application or or whatever but they are also costly uh, very uh, capital investment you know so you look at all this okay. so let us look at one such traditional application uh, which is salt production and you know we must focus i mean okay there are many things happening in the world but after all you know in in india we must see uh, what what is india strength india strength as i said is solar energy and uh, india also uh, has a long coastline naturally you know india is uh, uh, blessed to make salt and salt is one of the largest uh, uh, volume chemicals in the world every you know all the 7 and a half to 8 billion people everyone consumes salt maybe except for a few who are suffering from heart problems and whatever you know but everybody else eats salt i mean you have to produce salt salt is at the heart of chemicals like caustic soda chlorine soda ash there would be no chemical technology without uh, these three basic chemicals that's how important it is okay. and so let us try and understand okay uh, uh, how big the application of uh, solar energy is you know uh, in uh, evaporating sea water okay um, so um, you know you can see these uh, ladies uh, basically producing uh, uh, salt and then keeping the uh, salt okay. and uh, you know uh what is it all about and don't forget our independence i mean salt has been a very important it is connected with our uh, independence movement you know that is how important salt is okay so what do we do the only difference is in the sea water is constantly evaporating that's it you know over here you are not you are taking the water from the sea you are bringing it into land okay and then you are doing a uh, because sea water has got many different constituents in it sea water is not just about sodium chloride you know there are many other chemicals in the sea water and which you don't want to be present in the salt in nacl you know? so you have to remove them okay and so what this whole thing is all about is from the sea you know to bring in sea water into land okay, along the coast okay and then in a practical manner to carry out the progressive evaporation of sea water till the point when you get salt and these are those heaps of salt okay now what do you have to do uh, you see for one thing you have to evaporate a lot of water because uh, uh, sea water typically contains about 30 g per liter of sodium chloride you know there about 28 to 30 g per liter yeah. and uh, the saturation point of uh, uh, salt nacl is about 360 g per liter uh so you can imagine the amount of water that needs to be evaporated from 30 grams to 360 grams okay so that means you have to evaporate uh, more than 90% of the water you know if you have to get uh, solid nacl 
and along the way what you do is you start separating out all the impurities in sea water through a process of fractional crystallization okay so uh, did i show the yeah so let us look at uh, you know typically what are the things that are present in sea water you have got calcium magnesium sodium potassium chloride sulfate bromide there are many many other things but these are the main constituents okay now when this is sea water we are talking about a specific gravity of about 1.025 you know uh, and uh, this is a different way of expressing density of sea water which is uh, the two are related okay by this equation and this is known as the bomme scale of density okay and just to give you an idea you can see that like let's say if i am starting with say 1100 liters of sea water when i complete the process of making salt that 1100 liters has reduced to about 35 liters okay and uh, all the rest of the water is gone in this particular case it's about uh, where most of the salt is coming out uh, maybe you are re reducing about close to about uh, 90% okay a little more than that yeah. and if you look at the constituents you have got uh, 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 this and uh, uh, this these two together okay are the main constituents okay. these are given as uh, molar uh, concentrations okay so it's expressed as molar concentration so roughly about 0.5 uh, molar uh, sodium chloride okay and then these are of course uh, much smaller amounts okay? but they are so important uh, to remove that if you don't then you won't be able to make a lot of your chemicals they would be too impure you know? so you have to remove them okay? and uh, so what you do is that as i said these are different pans they are uh, you you charge water into these pans sea water okay? and is progressively evaporating okay? and uh, you know at one point uh, uh, at something like uh, maybe about uh, uh, 14 degree bomme you know uh, i told you about that scale um, what happens is uh, that uh, gypsum uh, starts crystallizing out okay why gypsum because uh, gypsum is a sparingly soluble salt okay and uh, so it has got much lower solubility than uh, any of these other things gypsum and calcium carbonate and magnesium carbonate okay so moment the solubility product of uh, gypsum is exceeded you know the gypsum will start coming out okay and so you collect it and that goes into your cement industry and everything and everything is being done with solar energy huh? nothing else now once i have removed the gypsum then i give some uh, further uh, treatments you know to the leftover brine and then put it into these pans okay where this is where the actual salt is produced these pans are very shallow okay? because you need a high surface area okay and so sodium chloride is being uh, formed here and it is being collected and you also get a mother liquor which is known as bittern okay and it's called bittern because it is bitter in taste this is a tremendous resource uh, for recovering uh, uh, many different kinds of uh, important chemicals like potash bromine magnesium chemicals okay all of those are recovered from this stuff okay so it's a very very important uh, thing and for that recovery you need to do further evaporation uh, which goes on okay till more salts are formed which contain potassium contain magnesium etc okay and uh, 
now the other thing is that this bittern you know just to give you an idea uh, it contains something like a total of 12 and a half molar concentration of these salts so can you imagine i mean it's mostly salts the very little water okay? and what happens is that this has a very high osmotic pressure okay the reason is because the water activity is very low and therefore the osmotic pressure of this is extremely high how high it exerts an osmotic pressure of more than 700 bar one bar you remember is one atmosphere we are talking about 700 bar which means that it has got a tremendous ability to do work okay? so solar energy is not just about evaporating water but it is also being left with these kinds of things where you have got pent up solar energy solar energy which is being converted into a form of chemical energy okay so keep that in uh, mind also now how much salt does india produce india produces 35 million tons of salt okay 35 and if you consider that uh, how much water had to be evaporated okay okay and uh, to make let's say 1 kg of salt we can figure out how much salt water has to be evaporated and you can imagine after all all that evaporation requires latent heat of energy okay and uh, so you know how much energy solar energy actually went in okay and if you had to do that with a uh, with fossil fuels or something it would be a huge requirement okay so uh, uh, bear that in mind okay now you can also see uh, another thing uh, that uh, you know it, it is not just important for you to know your uh, uh, pharmacy uh, subjects or uh, pharmaceutical sciences or chemical sciences or engineering sciences you should also have a sense and understanding of the country you know the geography of the country okay now just to give you an idea uh this which i have shown you is the a part of the run of kutch okay and this is a satellite image yeah? so from a satellite this photo was i think taken in 1996 or 7 or something and you can see it's all white over here and why it's white is that this is a creek okay it's called the kodi creek and the water you know is basically coming into this run of kutch to this creek and it is like a bowl you know this uh, topology of this uh, uh, of this place you know uh, the topography is uh, like a bowl okay and so once sea water goes in it can't come out so it keeps on evaporating okay and look at this you know it's a spectacular sight okay thousands of hectares you know you'll find salt like this that's what you see from here okay so already we are blessed with the fact that you know nature has given us a pan you know in which evaporation is occurring naturally you know it is keeping on evaporating water right and the salts are coming out and so i am getting you know this concentrated bittern which from which you can now recover many other chemicals so you know the biggest uh, bromine plants in our country are set up here okay? uh, from that bittern you know you recover uh, bromine okay now what you see over here is potassium sulfate so sulfate of potash you know this is a plant you know i think now it makes about 3 lakh tons uh, earlier it was making about 1.3 lakh tons 
so it takes that bittern you know and it has got vast areas of land and it uh, does all the evaporation and basically all the subsequent technologies for recovering uh, potash etc which i'll show you you know and and it makes this and this is the best potash fertilizer in the world you know potassium sulfate yeah so uh, it would never be possible to do any of this without solar energy it would be simply not cost effective all of this is possible because of uh, of solar energy the fact that uh, uh, in uh, in this place there is so much of sunshine you know it's a semi arid place okay so there is very little rainfall okay? and you can keep on evaporating and producing things okay uh, so uh, you know just so that you can relate solar energy with an actual production of a chemical you know so i'll just uh, i i told you that we uh, we have this and we are continuously evaporating further evaporating okay and uh, so uh, uh, so what happens is that when you keep on evaporating okay, at one point uh, you get this double salt uh, which is kcl mgso4 okay it's also known as kyanite okay and then uh, there is a process this is all based on a process that has been developed okay you decompose that salt with water and it gets converted into another double salt known as shonite k2so4 mgso4 okay and this is reacted with potassium chloride okay solution and it effectively ends up forming potassium sulfate that's what you see over here okay that's potassium sulfate right and then uh, uh, you know how to uh, make it a zero effluent uh, uh, process uh, basically when you uh, uh, get this you also get a mother liquor and basically through a series of uh, 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 steps okay uh, one can uh, effectively produce this uh, potassium chloride solution uh, which uh, you need to react to make this okay so that's the uh, overall process uh, what i want to say is that the majority of the operations are being done with solar energy all of this is with solar energy the only thing is that some of these operations are done in a factory where uh, you may require power for agitation for filtration for various things okay but rest of it the bulk of the energy for this entire process is being provided by solar energy okay now when you are talking also about solar energy especially for these kinds of applications uh, you know it's not enough to just know about solar energy there are other things uh, which are related that you must know about okay like for example uh, what are the geographical factors and the climatic factors you know like for example if i have got uh, a place with very high uh, humidity in the atmosphere then you know you will not be able to evaporate beyond a point because the rate of condensation uh, will be equal to the rate of evaporation uh, beyond a point for a certain uh, relative humidity so whatever i showed you uh, like making that particular uh, uh, product you know uh, you can only do it if the relative humidity is less than 60% okay and ideally it should be closer to about 40% you know and uh, so if you don't have that then doesn't matter how much sunshine and all you are getting uh, you will not be able to uh, produce it okay so it is very important to know about other climatic factors you know when you are uh, let's say considering uh, uh, making use of a renewable energy resource okay second is uh, also other factors which can be uh, facilitating factors or it could be detrimental factors like for example if you have strong wind you know it's wonderful because if you have strong wind means it will assist uh, the sun to uh, pull up the water you know 
uh, because of convection effects, right? So, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it will be great help if you have strong wind, plus you have got uh, uh, strong solar uh, energy, okay? Uh, if you make, let's say I make all this, but if the soil is such that everything percolates under, you know, then I will not get anything. Everything will be under. Okay. So I need obviously a place where there is low percolation, you know, so that whatever I'm producing uh, is remaining above ground. You know, otherwise I will not be able to harvest it. Okay. Uh, and of course you need to have abundant feedstock. So for example, in this particular case, you know, it's abundant feedstock. Sea water is continuously coming in with every tide. Uh, it's coming and uh, drenching this place. Okay. So, uh, uh, or, or if you are producing salt next to a sea coast, there's abundant uh, feedstock. There's abundant sea water. Okay. Uh, now, let us look at another uh, very interesting application, you know, which would be especially important uh, in these kinds of place, uh, places because there is no power, there's no electric grid, there's nothing over here, you know. So you, to, to get energy, you know, you need uh, other forms of energy besides solar energy. You need, uh, in some cases, energy with a high temperature, okay. So uh, you'll have to see how to get that. Okay? So this, for example, is something known as a solar pond, you know. And I showed you this man, uh, uh, Datta, you know, who had, uh, uh, who was also recognized for his work on uh, solar pond. Now, let me tell you what it is. I showed you this, uh, say, bittern or very concentrated salt solutions. And uh, what, what happens is that, uh, you know, as you are evaporating, the density, the specific gravity continuously increases as you would expect. Okay. And so, uh, you know, it's very heavy, heavy. This stuff is much heavier than this stuff. Okay? So what you do is that you charge a very heavy density brine, uh, like let's say into a pond. You know, you make this pond. Okay? This pond is uh, uh, made uh, uh, absolutely non-percolating so that nothing percolates. Okay, And what you do is that you paint the surface of this pond black. Okay. And above that, you put, a, maybe you will put seawater, you know, something which is uh, of a much lower density with much less amount of uh, salt. Okay. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and there is another uh, solution uh, which you keep flowing. Uh, don't worry about it right now, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's flown for a particular reason. Okay. Now what happens is because this surface is painted black. Okay. And, uh, so the sun's radiation, it penetrates and reaches all the way to the bottom and it gets absorbed here because it is black okay? and it heats up the liquid, you know, this stuff. Okay, which is in contact with it, all right, this. Now, what happens is that because it is at a much higher density and it, even though you have got, uh, you know, a lot of the thermal energy, it is at a temperature of something like 70, 80, 90 degree centigrade, okay, because it is heavy and this is light, so this stuff cannot sink in and it cannot so in other words, there is no convection, there is no convective flow that takes place. Okay. So it is really a non-convective zone. Okay? And so the heat will remain over here because normally one way in which uh, heat dissipates is through convection. Okay? And some heat will of course dissipate through radiation. But the radiation effects will occur from the surface of this, you know, and not from here. So this will start, it will continuously keep heating and getting hotter and hotter, you know. In principle, you can actually reach temperatures as high as 100 and, uh, 
15, 20 degrees centigrade. You know? uh, but normally, you know, uh, it's allowed to reach temperatures of around 80 degrees centigrade. Okay. And then uh, you can actually take out this and with a heat exchange, you know, you can heat up other things. Like, for example, if you need to heat up some solution, okay, uh, to do some crystallization, recrystallization, something, okay. And uh, so you need to heat it up. Uh, you can uh, actually take the process heat uh, from this. And so it is, again, solar energy, uh, which is being uh, trapped over here, okay. And this is what is known as a solar pond. It was first invented in Israel, okay. And uh, but very soon after in India, you know, the first solar ponds were uh, set up. There are very few of them now. You know, as I told you, people have got so pampered with fossil fuels, you know, that everybody has forgotten. But I can tell you this much that these are the kinds of technologies uh, which in the coming years uh, will become extremely important. Okay. And you can see that you can make the brine near boiling point. That's how hot you can uh, make it. Okay? Uh, it's, it's just a, a fantastic technology. Okay? Now, let me also show you uh, a, a, an actual construction of a solar pond. Okay? So this is a pond. Okay? And so that very dense uh, uh, brine you will put at the bottom of this pond. And that pond would be black in color. You know? And uh, above that, you will put uh, uh, a, a, a kind of a brine with uh, uh, less salinity, okay. And then what you'll also do is put these rings, okay. Now these rings are like windbreakers, you know, uh, because if you don't put them, and if there's a strong wind, you know what will happen is that the water will become uh, uh, the top surface, you know, will uh, become so agitated. Uh, that uh, the solar uh, radiation will not really travel to the bottom. You know? It will just get scattered uh, from the surface. Okay? So you need to make the surface as still as possible okay? so that the solar energy can uh, uh, nicely fall. Okay? And you can see, uh, uh, for example, you know, uh, uh, this is a pump. Okay? And the hot brine uh, is being taken out from the bottom, okay. And then you know it is being used for uh, some industrial uh, applications, okay. Uh, in this particular case, of course, uh, the temperatures were uh, closer to about 75, 80 degree, you know. But as you will see from here, you can make it almost reach the boiling point. And boiling point for this kind of concentrated brine will be something like 100. 10, 120 degrees centigrade. Okay? So uh, that's the kind of temperature you can reach over here. Okay? Now, uh, let me also tell you that uh, for all of you who are, uh, let's say, mechanical engineers or uh, civil engineers, you can imagine that you require uh, a lot of civil engineering to optimally design this pond. You need mechanical engineering for pumping. Know, many other things, you know, I, I mean, so uh, uh, your, uh, you could actually have a, a tremendously useful role uh, to play uh, in designing such things. Okay. In fact, uh, see, all these ponds have been made flat. But now suppose you take advantage of what we discussed about latitude and declination angles you know, etc. you know, and uh, it would be interesting to ask that what would happen if I made this pond slanted in the right way, so that, you know, it traps even more radiation. Okay, so, uh, you know, it will be very interesting to uh, uh, look at those. Okay? Now, this is another very, very important uh, application of uh, uh, solar energy, okay. And this is known as the solar still. Uh, this one uh, was actually one of the earliest stills, uh, which was constructed in Chile. You know? And you can see uh, from very saline waters, 
you know it generates something like 25000 liters of uh, fresh water per day you know in a place where there is uh, no fresh water okay so uh, let us try and understand you know uh, that how exactly uh, these kinds of stills are uh, constructed now uh, what you can see is that you know in this design of the stills you will see that there is a slant okay so this takes into account you know all the things that we talked about you know in terms of uh, uh, for a particular latitude uh, where you are located what is the uh, best angle what is the best kind of slope uh, to have uh, and let the solar energy fall on that sloping surface okay so that you maximize the uh, insulation all right now what it is is that you can see it so well uh, this one uh, used to produce something like uh, i think about 5000 uh, liters of uh, drinking water and the beauty is you know you don't have to do much you know these things are more or less unattended so it's just using solar energy and uh, evaporating okay and uh, so let me uh, uh, tell you what uh, uh, what it is you know these units okay um, now typically the still this this is one solar still okay now uh, this solar still just like the solar pond has a bottom which is black right and uh, the radiation from the sun is falling on that okay? now you may also choose to put in these reflectors what reflectors do is that i can collect more light okay which normally wouldn't have been incident on this uh, thing you know i can uh, effectively collect and localize it or focus it again into the solar scale so overall the amount of solar radiation that is falling you know on this still uh will be higher uh, when i use these reflectors okay uh, and you can see her collecting uh, uh, pure water okay from a very salty uh, water solution okay now on the top you have a glass cover okay over here right and the bottom is not uh, quite so simple as i have shown you uh, there are certain steps you know Uh, in that uh, construction but don't go into uh, need not go into so much of detail okay you just need to remember that it is charged with sea water or very salty water okay and uh, you know because the solar energy is falling on it and the bottom is black so water will start evaporating and it will go and condense on the inside of this glass cover okay and what will happen is that instead of falling back the water on the glass cover just slides out you know it rolls along the glass you know and then it is collected uh, through these uh, uh, pipes okay it just comes out and uh, that's what you are collecting so effectively uh, that's the construction uh, of a solar uh, still now uh, of course Uh, all of these things their efficiency uh, will depend on the uh, on the time of year you know so for example you can see a plot okay uh, production this is production uh, in uh, liters per day okay from one unit okay and uh, uh, this is the efficiency efficiency means you estimate the total amount of solar radiation that fell uh, on this okay and how much water you collected okay and from what is the latent heat and this that you figure out all that okay and then you can figure out you know what is the efficiency of converting solar energy into uh, distillation uh, for getting this water okay that's what you are uh, doing and uh, so it is the glass so it is a closed the only difference between the water cycle nature's water cycle and this nature's water cycle is basically i don't have to put anything na water is uh, just evaporating uh, 
but the gravity of the earth you know uh, effectively makes the system close you know and so uh, uh, water won't escape into space you know and so it hangs around and it forms uh, clouds okay and uh, so uh, it becomes a closed system by virtue of the sun's uh, the earth's uh, gravitational pull okay here i don't have that luxury you know so i need a glass cover you know, so that uh, the water can actually be collected okay uh, so you can see like this is a very very saline area and there are hundreds of these you know, and uh, each one of them uh, basically is identical as i told you you know uh, the design yeah okay. uh, and uh, now i am not going through all the detailed uh, mathematics you know of how to optimize okay uh, these kinds of systems okay and uh, what are the parameters that you need to monitor uh, in the process of optimizing you know like for example just to give you an idea uh, you see uh, i told you that the water evaporates and collects on the bottom side of the glass but the point is that when it is very hot my glass also is very hot so you know the extent of condensation of the water uh, will be poor you know if the glass is hot so i need to actually find some way of making sure that this glass you know is uh, is kept cold okay i mean as cold as it can be so what are the innovations in a in a field uh, that will allow for something like this to happen one is that you might want to uh, spray the raw water you know on the top surface okay and uh, just so that it cools the glass and it facilitates the condensation but the problem is because there is a lot of salts etc in the water you know and when you are spraying it so you can get a build up of salt you know a film of salt on this and that will block up your sun rays so uh, you know it might look like a good idea but when you go to do it in practice uh, there is a problem also like if say i am evaporating the sea water now as sea water is keeping on evaporating uh, it can produce uh, scales and salt so uh, you will need to take those out because otherwise you know it will go and coat that black surface and the surface will no longer look black it, it, it will be all white uh, scales and uh, things like that so you know this this the glass over here uh, is actually detachable you can actually pull it out yeah and once you pull it out uh, then you can let's say every few days you know you can clean up this uh, still uh, make sure that all the scales salt etc are removed you know and then you again charge the uh, sea water and put back this uh, glass you know uh, but then again uh, glass uh, can break okay so uh, you could also consider putting a plastic sheet okay? uh, if uh, it does not interfere with the uh, transmission of the solar uh, radiation Okay. you could do that the most ideal would be uh, if it was possible to make a transparent metallic uh, 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 layer you know i mean instead of glass because if it is a metal then it will be uh, conducting thermally conducting you know and then i can keep my uh, top surface much cooler you know uh, by circulating some fluid or whatever you know and that would be nice uh, but uh, so far it is difficult to get uh, uh, metal most metals are uh, not most all uh, uh, are opaque you know so it will not allow the uh, solar energy to uh, pass through you know uh, but you know there is work going on in trying to make uh, transparent films of metal okay uh, in fact if you make a stainless steel foil sufficiently thin it actually becomes transparent you know so uh, uh, you know those are the kinds of things that you may need to uh, consider uh, you know for 
improving the performance of the still. Uh, obviously, uh, your ambient, your wind velocity, you know, it will help to cool the surface. Okay, if I have got a strong wind, okay, and uh, what is your ambient temperature? Because the ambient temperature will determine, uh, you know, your glass surface, your top surface uh, temperature, and what will be the efficiency of cooling. Okay, and uh, so you can go one by one, you know, into all the parameters. You know, like the input water which I'm putting in, uh, is it a cold water or hot water or what type of water is it? Okay, uh, so uh, you can actually uh, look at all these. And so, for example, you know this is a a, a modeling uh, that has been done uh, considering uh, all these parameters and then basically trying to see uh, which is the uh, best fit, you know, to the actual experimental data. Now, in many of these, what happens is also that uh, during the daytime, because of this uh, high temperature of the glass, you know, the condensation is poor. But at night, you know, when the uh, weather gets cold, you know, then the inside is still hot, okay, because it's thermally insulated. And so you can keep collecting water even at night. Okay? Uh, water will keep uh, evaporating and condensing. So part of this water is collected during the day and part of it at night. Okay, so uh, that's a, a solar still. Now take a solar dryer. Okay, another extremely important uh, uh, an equipment. Okay, uh, so for example, you know I can of course dry uh, anything out in the open. Okay? There's no problem. You can dry it. Problem is that you know when it's outside, uh, in all cases it is not hygienic. You know? There could be bird excreta, you know, a lot of strong wind and dust and dirt and things can get on. Okay, and so all of those could create a problem you know, when you dry outside. So if you want to, let's say, if you want to dry fish, like these uh, in this Sundarban, you know, in this place. Uh, they they thrive on basically selling uh, dried fish, you know? and so you know this is the fish. Now normally uh, they would put it outside, you know? but uh, in this particular solar dryer, uh, you know it uh, effectively does the uh, drying uh, in a much more uh, hygienic uh, way. And this is a natural convection dryer because you know there is a black surface. Again, it heats up, you know, hot air. So as the hot air is going out, you know, cold air will rush into this thing. So you set up a natural convection, okay? And uh, so that's what maintains the circulation. Okay? And so you know, you can uh, you can do this, or uh, you can uh, uh, make this device uh, more sophisticated, okay? Like uh, you, you can see. Uh, this is a device that has been made, uh, which is quite sophisticated. For one, uh, it has uh, uh, these uh, 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 reflectors, so the amount of heat that will go in, you know, will be more uh, because the insulation is being uh, trapped from here also and here. It's being harnessed from here and here also. Okay, and so uh, you know, uh, so this chamber. Uh, is only for hot air generation, and that's why it's slanted. You know, so it takes into account the latitude, you know, where we are, you know, declination angle and uh, things like that. You know, and uh, what would be the best average uh, slant uh, to have for maximum exposure to the sun? Okay. Now, so over here you are generating hot air, okay. nothing else. And this chamber over here is where you will put uh, your vegetable or fruit or fish or whatever you want to dry okay, into this. So the hot air is going from here, okay, and you know because it's all out in the uh, uh, sun, so you can put a small PV panel, okay, photovoltaic panel, and what it does is that one uh, it uh, uh, there is a fan uh, over here, 
so it allows for a forced convection of uh, of the air it, just, it doesn't rely on uh, only natural convection okay so uh, you have a fan which is run with with this you know and then uh, there are other interesting things and we will discuss those okay but what you can see is like say in this unit i mean you put in grapes okay and after uh, seven hours you know it become raisins okay? and uh, uh, you know not so easy to make uh, uh, raisins uh, uh, that fast you know uh, but you can actually do it uh, over a day uh, when uh, with this kind of a unit okay hmm. now uh, what uh, you need to do is that when you are let's say trying to operate these kinds of uh, units okay uh, you must observe carefully right a few things and uh, and 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 kind of uh, optimize the system uh, based on that so for example uh, what you find is like if you take um, the moisture you know which is present in this let's say grapes okay uh, and uh, you have taken a certain amount so initially in grape there is 0.8 kg moisture per kg of grape you know na no? if you just bite into grape it's all water okay and when you have come here okay it has gone to less than 0.1 okay and uh, so maybe about 5% moisture or there about okay at this point now what you can also see is that this curve is not necessarily uh, linear you know throughout so for example uh, you can you can get uh, uh, most of the moisture removed uh, let's say by at this point okay and uh, uh, so and the next uh, uh, for 3 hours or so uh, goes to remove very tiny amounts of moisture okay uh, it, it, it's not uh, uh, too much of moisture that is being uh, released you know from the uh, from this uh, but whereas in the first uh, five hours you have got uh, a lot of the moisture coming out so but what is happening is that when when this air is exiting uh, let's say after the 5 uh, hour okay it doesn't have much moisture but it is hot because this hot air you know this the uh, hot air is going in okay no, not much moisture is being evaporated so it doesn't even cool down that much okay a latent heat which is being uh, provided is uh, less okay so what is coming out is again quite hot air and with small amount of uh, uh, water in it okay now what you can do then is that you can recycle uh, this air you know, back over here okay? so if this is what it shows you know there is a recycle this pipe you know, is meant for recycle okay? whereas uh, this one is coming uh, directly from the uh, atmosphere you know so because you don't have to now do so much of preheating you know because it's already uh, quite hot the air you know so you can improve the overall efficiency you know, uh, with which you can dry all right uh, and uh, you know you can uh, using the this panel uh, you can have uh, some sensors for humidity you know you can estimate the moisture in the air in the exiting air and then take a decision uh, whether to let out that air or to recycle that air okay and you could have a solenoid valve you know which is being controlled uh, you know by this panel okay so this panel might be operating some sensors uh, the solenoid valve and also the exhaust uh, fan okay so uh, you know all of that uh, can be done from this small uh, panel so that's the way in which you can uh, make very interesting uh, uh, units okay you can also do another thing like for example uh, what you can do is that the air that is coming in uh, you see if for example there is too much of humidity okay then uh, you know 
the air is not going to have the capacity to take up too much of moisture so uh, you will be just heating up the air and it's not doing useful work okay. so what you can do is that you can have a drying agent you know at the inlet of the air and so let the air be sucked in uh, and dried by the drying agent and then it is put in and the drying agent later on you can heat and uh, remove the moisture uh, why you might want to do that is over here you have got a limitation of temperature i i cannot make the temperature 150 degree because my fruits and vegetables everything will get charred will get spoiled okay so i have to operate in a temperature range of around maybe 50 60 uh, degrees or uh, uh, so you know 70 degree not more than that okay. otherwise the taste of the food etc will uh, be spoiled Whereas this drying agent, I don't care. I can dry it at 200 degrees centigrade. Okay. So uh, uh, that would be the best way uh, in overall uh, designing the unit. Is it clear to everyone? Any questions? Yes, sir. Okay, all clear, na? Hmm. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Okay. and in fact you know there is a person uh, who did his phd with uh, uh, professor forat you know in our uh, chemical engineering professor forat is now in odisha and this guy dr vaibhav tikke i mean he he uh, got passionate about uh, solar dryers you know and uh, he has made uh, uh, all kinds of products you know uh, based on fairly low tech uh, Uh, uh things you know not high tech stuff like uh, this you know much more low tech uh, but then you know he is uh, he is become an entrepreneur he is uh, uh, set up uh, these he makes he gets plenty of orders you know uh, now he's also gone into the area of uh, actually uh, uh, not only uh, selling the units uh, but also selling some haldi this that you know uh, dried stuff you know so uh, so you could actually think of uh, becoming an entrepreneur you know with this kind of uh, devices okay now let's come to the solar cooker okay. solar cooker is also very very interesting uh, you know and uh, uh, in fact you know uh, there are people let me tell you who are passionate about solar energy you know they will not cook with uh, gas and Uh, all the stoves and all huh? they actually will just go and put it if they have a terrace or outside in their veranda or somewhere you know where when there is good sunshine okay and you can see you can put uh, your rice dal everything you know again all the principle is the same the bottom is black okay and then you have a lid okay and from here uh, the sunlight is going and uh, you can also use this as a reflector and get more insulation in okay and in a few hours your food and all will get cooked okay and just take it out and uh, uh, so it's uh, it's a very nice thing i mean uh, you know we don't do this and for whatever reason uh, these units are have not become that popular uh, but i feel that uh, you know you can try it out and what you can do is that like you will do a masters in green tech maybe you should take such things and see how you can improve the system can you think of any improvement that you can make i mean it may be that it will increase the cost let it be uh, but you can at least try and play around okay and think of uh, maybe improvising on uh, all of these units and making them more efficient that's the way many of these units have been developed okay i mean it was all about can we do this can we do that you know and that's how you uh, uh, keep improving these uh, units okay all clear up till now clear yes sir okay all right now you know most of these Things that I've talked to you up till 
now about are uh, uh, like direct insulation of solar energy maybe using those reflectors you know and maybe using the slant you know which we uh, talked about uh, which uh, helps to uh, uh, get a better uh, collection of the solar radiation okay uh, so but as such there has been no other intervention okay in these uh, uh, units okay but now let us look at okay what are known as concentrator concentrating devices uh like for example just to give you an idea uh people are just like they are talking about uh, uh you know uh, uh solar photovoltaic and of course most of it is solar photovoltaic but there have been a few plants that have been put up based on solar thermal energy that is you reach such a high temperature that you can run a turbine and generate power you know by the conventional uh turbines okay and those are all done with what are known as concentrating devices okay concentrators you know uh, let me uh, take you through some of the uh, important things to know about uh, uh, about a uh, uh, concentrator and uh, it is all based on uh, really the properties of parabola okay right that's that's it because like say this is a parabolic uh, crop you know you can see now i can suppose i take sections you know and i make cross sections of these so i can and if i make infinite number you can see that each one would look like a parabola okay it would look like this right and the aggregate of that when integrated is your uh, crop right so uh, let us look at uh, some of the important properties of uh, parabola okay now parabola has this equation okay y is equal to 1 over 4f x squared okay and uh, so uh, so if uh, if let's say uh, this of course is shown as y and x it doesn't matter i can uh, change the dimension you can see uh, that if i am uh, if if i am let's say if i call it x axis and this is y axis then as i am changing x you know obviously for every value of x i have a different value for y okay and it is symmetric okay the value here and here uh, is uh, in magnitude it is the same except that the signs are different you know but in terms of intensity it would be similar so it would be that's why it's a square when i take the square it becomes a positive number with the same value okay so y is equal to 1 upon 4f x squared and what is f f is basically my focal point focal length okay? the shallower it is getting uh, your focal length is increasing okay over here this is f4 okay this one okay and this is 1 and this is f1 okay this is the focal length okay so let us try and look at some definitions so one is the focal length that i told you okay uh, so this is the uh, focal length now focal length uh, uh, is uh, uh, let let me explain to you what is the meaning of focal length okay or focal point okay what is the focal point now parabola has a very interesting property that for example if i have say from the sun i have parallel beams of light you know falling on this okay for, and let's say this is a a a a, a, a reflecting surface okay so it's got mirror it's a reflecting surface so what will happen is that when the light falls here you know it will reflect okay now the property of the parabola which makes it so interesting okay, is that doesn't matter where the light falls whether it falling here 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 okay in every case it will reflect and all of this light will intersect at this point 
and this is my focal point okay in other words you see what you are saying is although my solar energy is falling over this entire area okay it is all getting concentrated at a point and therefore i can multiply you know the intensity of the my solar radiation okay over here and in fact uh, because of this you know you can reach temperatures uh, which can be uh, thousands of degrees all right uh, it just depends on how much area you are capturing the light over your solar energy over you know and how sharp is your uh, focal point you know that in turn will uh, depend on how well you have designed uh, this particular unit okay now what is it that makes this parabola uh, do this you know i was trying to uh, uh, think that uh, let me try and explain okay now there is for those who are familiar with the mathematics okay this thing over here is known as this line is known as a directrix okay directrix this line this vertex of the parabola this is the vertex okay is not on this line the vertex is here now the property of this line which is known as the directrix and of the parabola is very interesting is that you know any point if i take a point from the directrix to the parabola okay i uh, yeah over here and a vertical line and if i take the line from that point to the focal point the two line lengths are identical okay over here also you can see you know this length is equal to this length okay and anywhere it will be true okay that is the unique property of the parabola now what happens is suppose let's assume that this is not there okay and my light which was coming this way right it would go and hit this place this would be the shortest distance you know we know that light travels by the shortest distance okay now when it cannot come here and is getting reflected light will still want to take the shortest path that's the property of light it always takes the shortest path of the shortest time you know and because this is the shortest length this is the shortest length from this point to this point okay so and because this length is equal to this length this also must be the shortest length you know between this point and this you know so what happens is that uh, this is the reason why all of these will ultimately go and intersect at the focal point okay now the some of the uh, things that you need to uh, uh, know okay uh, one is that uh, that uh, there is a this is all parabola huh? and then uh, there is a length that is how long is this trough okay. so this is the length of the trough okay. now the width from one end to the other this is called the aperture okay so this is the aperture of the trough a okay and focal point we have already discussed you know uh, what is the focal point and that is basically determined by this equation okay yeah. and it will depend on the parabola that you have now there is another uh, uh, angle that you need to uh, understand okay and that is known as the rim angle okay the rim angle is like from the vertex i take a uh, uh, the uh, uh, the line you know uh, to the focal uh, point this line okay and from the focal point i go and draw a line to the rim 
okay so if my focal point is here i'll uh, uh, you know it will go and this will be my line okay now the angle that this makes this is what is known as the rim angle okay and this is extremely important okay this angle right and it is actually what is used uh, in uh, in scaling up these parabolic troughs what has been found is that if you want to make from a go from a small parabolic trough to let's say 1000 uh, times larger you know size then if you keep the rim angles constant then you will not go wrong the two will behave more or less identically okay the two uh, uh, setups right so that's why the rim angle is very critical and uh, and as i have explained to you i mean this is uh, really the essence of the parabola that doesn't matter where it falls as long as parallel radiation is falling anywhere on the trough uh, wherever it will go and intersect at the focal point okay so can you imagine the multiplication of intensity over here now when you have uh, suppose so i have got a focal point i've got a trough now it will have a focal point okay now every parabola over here if i go along this will have the same focal point because it's completely symmetric this unit <laughs> so effectively what it means is that if i at this point if i put a tube okay a tube at the focal point and suppose i pass water you know through that and all of this radiation from everywhere will go and focus on the focal point for the respective parabolas okay so effectively what will happen is that my tube will get uniformly heated you know by the solar radiation and it will get concentrated depending on what is the total area on which my radiation is falling and what is the area over which it is concentrating okay is that clear to everyone the properties of the parabola yes sir okay any questions from anyone no sir clear no sir yes sir yes sir 